Hello! Welcome to an adventure. Today uh, on, what is this, episode 25 of uh, Archival Adventures, um, we're going to be looking at the history of backyard grilling again. Uh, this is episode two. We'll be doing this all month with uh, backyard grilling as the topic. I'm Anthony Wright Day Hernandez. I'm the Community Collections Archivist here at Virginia Tech. Um, and we will be exploring this topic through our Rare Books collection. Um, before we begin, uh, just a couple of acknowledgments to do. Um, we acknowledge the Tudelo and Monacan Nations uh, people uh, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live here at Virginia Tech and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. We pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan Nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. Um, we also acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. At any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. We pay respect to these souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to this legacy. Further, we acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land and acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. So, always important to make those acknowledgments at the beginning. Uh, hi, Key Squared and Hannah and Fluid N. Welcome, welcome to Archival Adventures for today. Um, so, if you were here last week, uh, you'll remember that we started our exploration of the topic of backyard grilling. Um, and we started in the late 1800s uh, and kind of explored the late 1800s and the early 1900s, um, looking mostly at camp cooking, uh, cooking that people would do when they were out camping or on a long excursion, um, ended with like uh, a Girl Scout cookbook and a Boy Scout cookbook uh, toward the end. Um, and so this week we're going to continue chronologically still um, and we'll start getting into the World War II era. Um, I don't know exactly how far we'll get in today's uh, episode, but World War II is when we start to see, at, or after World War II is when we'll start to see uh, the creation of suburban neighborhoods in America. Um, and that's when like the idea of the suburban backyard and like the backyard grill party really start to develop. So that is where we will be um, and we'll be looking at. Um, music is a bit loud. Okay, I can adjust that. Thank you. Uh, it's always loud in my ears with this current setup. So let me know if that is better. <laughs> but yeah, my, the, the way this is set up here, it's always loud for me. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, I, I'm going to switch over to the document view and we can start taking a look at some of these materials. Um, so the first one that I've got for you today is an item called Swift's Premium Creative Cookery for the Host and Hostess by Martha Logan, home economist, Swift & Company. I do not have a date on this one. Purely based on the um, illustrations, uh, I believe that this is sometime around the 1940s, 1950s, um, but it is undated. So I don't know. Um, I do think there was maybe a note in the catalog that also indicated it might have been 1940s, but yeah, there's there's no date on the item itself that I've been able to locate. So uh, we're just going to go with that and look at it first today and see what it's got to say about grilling. So, um, let's see here, the start of this, Swift's Premium, the two most trusted words in meat, um, which tells me that this is likely going to be one large ad for Swift's Premium. 
but that doesn't mean it won't have useful recipes. I'm just trying to zoom in a little bit here. So outdoor grill cookery. The outdoor grill is of many kinds. The essentials are rods, pipes, or bars placed two to three inches apart over a bed of, coal, of hot coals. Some experts insist on six to 12 inches between grill and coals. Some portable grills hold the meat closer to the heat and therefore shorten the cooking time. Many are built with adjustable grates so that they may be raised or lowered to control the speed of cooking. Spits turned manually or automatically are ideal for rotisserie cooking, roasts, poultry, spare ribs, and such. Some meats are best when cooked in a skillet or on a griddle placed on the grill. So, I mean, that all sounds pretty typical to something that we would encounter today. Um, and also really not that far off from the um, type of information that was being given in the camp cookbooks. Uh, oh, so you found an Etsy listing and they have it listed as being from the 60s. So yeah, I mean, it really there's not a whole lot other than the illustrations to date it. So 60s is entirely possible with this illustration style. Um, so it's probably a little ahead of the time that we should be starting at for today, but I'm just going to stick with it. Uh, so the fuel, hardwood, charcoal, or briquettes have hot heat without smoke or flame. So, okay, so the fact that they mentioned briquettes means you're probably pretty ac or they're probably pretty accurate with, accurate with that Etsy listing, Hannah, um, in that it's probably closer to the 60s. Um, I don't know the exact date when briquettes came about, but they mentioned briquettes and liquid starters here. So, yes, product placement count one. <laughs> um, liquid starters that can be drizzled or sprayed over the fuel make fire building a pleasant, quickly done task. Electric starters are fine if an electric outlet is nearby. Start the fire 30 to 60 minutes ahead of time to make a bed of hot coals four to six inches deep. Rub the grill with suet or salad oil to prevent meat sticking to the bars. Trim off excess fat from meat to prevent flames and smoke. Place the meat on the grill so that the pieces do not touch. Use long tongs to turn the meat every 10 minutes at first to prevent excessive drip. To prevent smoking and flaming in rotisserie cooking, use a drip pan. Double thickness of heavy duty aluminum foil. If coals flame, douse with a little water. Use a sprinkler can. <laughs> okay, or a child's water gun. <laughs> so yeah, this is uh, just from these small details, definitely gonna be like 1960s time frame. After the cooking is completed, scoop the hot briquettes into a pail or can. Using a short-handled dustpan, dust pan, cover closely to smother the fire and save the fuel to be used another time. Tips on come handies, uh, which seems to be a term they're using to refer to the tools. Poker and shovel, shovel for coals. Oh, these will think. Come handies, things that will come in handy, I think is what they mean. A long spout sprinkling can to douse flames, padded mitts and big pot holders to protect fingers, long handled fork, perhaps two, long handled spoon, several 10 to 12 inch skewers for kebab cookery, folding wire broiler or an old fashioned wire toaster with long handles to hold meat and make turning easy, long handled swab, cloth on a stick, or a new paintbrush to apply sauce. Long-handled skillet and saucepans, big shakers for salt and seasonings, cutting board, sharp carving and slicing knives. So this really feels like a jump forward from what we were looking at last week. And, and 
rightly so. Like, I think we've jumped like 30 years, 30 or th 20 or 30 years from the last things we looked at last week. Um, so it might have made more sense for me to, to put this one aside for the moment and look at I'm going to do that. Before we dive into the recipes, I'm going, to, I'm going to pull out some of the older ones. Since this is clearly 1960s, now that we've looked at it a little bit, we're not out of the 40s yet. Here I have Cook It Outdoors from 1941 by James Beard. Um, James Beard might be a name that you uh, are familiar with if you have ever watched any sort of cooking show ever. <laughs> um, they do talk about James Beard quite a lot on TV cooking shows. Uh, so this is the eighth printing of this book. Um, and it was printed in 1947. No polite cookbook this. It is the answer to the colossal appetites that develop in spring, summer, or when active sports and the urge to live in the open air are paramount ideas in every man's head. It is a man's book written by a man who understands not only the healthy outdoor eating and cooking habits, but who is an expert at the subtle nuances of tricky flavoring as well. And it will be invaluable to the woman who aims to please the masculine members of her household. Here are new ideas for the barbecue pit, the portable stoves, and some swell new sauces and stews that will enliven any outdoor party. There are also some good ideas for the small terrace or the pint-sized garden if you would be an outdoor cook in the city. Good suggestions and sketches for equipping the outdoor kitchen and advice on stocking the shelves. A good workable book that will take a heck of a lot of wear and be a darned good companion to the outdoor cook. Uh, oh, and the back flap is just reviews from other people or from, yeah, re just reviews. So, Cook It Outdoors by James Beard, author of Hors d'oeuvres and Canapes and Fowl and Game Cookery. So this is um, originally copywritten 1941, which would be before World War II. This printing is from two years after, right? Or my, my brain is now going to screw up dates related to World War II. When was the... J day, which would have been like the end. So the, the war started in 39, but the U.S. didn't enter until later. Pardon me, as my brain tries to remember dates and details of world history, which are not things that I do easily. Uh, yes, so 1941 would have been when the US entered World War II with the bombing in Pearl Harbor in December of that year. So this book came out before the US was in the war. Um, and the war did end in 1945, so this printing of this book is from two years after the war. <laughs> so, yeah, Portico, thank you for dropping dates in the chat. Um, I thought I was getting my dates right as far as like 47 being two years after the end of the war, but then I immediately said, oh, wait, am I correct in that? And had to go and look it up. So <laughs> Um, and the fact that this was printed in 41, it was two years after the war started, but the U.S. wasn't in the war yet. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. And this is a, a Cook It Outdoors 
and we'll see whether it's closer to the camping cookbook or what we would expect from a backyard grill. Pots and pans, even old tin cans, a little food, a little fire, from here to there, eating. Homer Wheelton. Um, <laughs> wow, the introduction here. Our sometime ancestors, crashing through jungles or sloshing through the marshes and the soggy fields, were most enthusiastic diners out. They would tear a leg off an animal, toast it over a roaring fire, and toss it down the hatch, accompanied by a little wild garlic, perhaps, a couple of bananas, and a few leaves from some long since forgotten tree. There was little attempt at that time to count calories or to maintain a well-balanced diet. The same principles go for outdoor eating today. Primarily outdoor cooking is man's work and man-sized menus and portions should be the rule. What fun is there to a picnic or a barbecue if there is present the feeling of discipline or restraint? So I say whether you have a small electric grill on a stamp-sized terrace on the 92nd floor of a New York apartment house, or an outdoor stove in the heart of Wyoming that will accommodate pots and pans large enough to feed three divisions of the army, the rules and the ideas are the same. For satisfaction all around, there should be excellent food, well-cooked, good liquor, good liquor and or good wines plenty of all and a large chunk of gaiety and good fellowship there may be traditional or familiar ideas and recipes left out of this book if so it is because i am taking for granted that you know how to deal with such situations practically all the recipes given are suited to all types of equipment you can do most of the stews and casserole dishes on the small electric stoves for the terrace and the gasoline stoves for the camp in the fireplace or the open air grill at the end of the garden. I've tried to be quite universal in the selection and to make them all thoroughly adaptable. Of course, I don't expect you to dig up your lawn for a New England clam bake or a Polynesian barbecue, but there are times when the directions for these occasions may be put to work as they were intended. If you do not already have an outdoor cookery unit and are planning one, the suggestions in the first chapter will help you in many ways. Go slowly and accumulate the finer pieces uh, of equipment rather than a Go slowly and accumulate the finer pieces of equipment rather than use a great many things which will have to be replaced. This will bring far more satisfying results. Success to you, whether your first task is to be grilling two lamb chops or barbecuing a couple of pigs. Do either with a hearty spirit and have a good time doing it. Otherwise, there is no point to this business at all. <laughs> all right. So it starts off with uh, various forms of outdoor cookery and suggestions for equipment. Um... Talking about a barbecue pit first. <clears throat> so this is definitely back, like we saw this last week in a number of the camping books where it gives like diagrams and instructions for building an outdoor fireplace. Like I've never gone on a camping trip where I felt inclined to build myself a full on stone fireplace out in the wilderness. Um, like that would have to be a camp that was gonna be there for a long time uh, to, to warrant the amount of work that it would take to build a fireplace like this. But here we are again uh, with an illustration and this is a fireplace you might build yourself. The cost will be a few bags of concrete, sand, some lengths of iron pipe for the grill, a couple of sections of flue lining, and much elbow grease. The stones you should be able to dig up around your grounds. In building the grill, set the bars about two inches into the flanking walls. There's this assumption that <clears throat> you're gonna do this yourself. Like if you were gonna make an outdoor grill today, if you were gonna have an outdoor fireplace today, that's something you would hire a contractor to do. You would not, typically most people are not just going to go out into their backyard, dig up some stones, and construct a fireplace in their backyard. 
But in all of these books, it's assuming that you're just going to gather these stones and put this thing together yourself, which is um, just kind of a different attitude. <clears throat> oh, wow. That is an extensive fireplace. The fireplace above, which has a steak grill and a range unit, should be built by a good mason. Foundations are not necessary in all parts of the country, but they should extend below your winter frost level. So, yeah, this one is one that is, they, they say you should hire somebody to do. <laughs> wow. Portable cooking equipment for the garden. Most of these stoves are compact enough to fold and stow in your car for a picnic or a camping trip and thus fill a double duty in many ways. Equipment for the outdoor stove. I want to... Oh, so it addresses camping. And since basically every book we looked at last week was intended primarily for camping, um, it's interesting here that it says, this starts off, this book does not pretend to be a camping guide in any way, shape, or form. However, be, being very, fairly concerned with the top... However, being fairly conversant with the type of equipment needed and knowing that it is an ever-present problem to many people, here goes. You seasoned campers need no advice, so you can take a back seat and wait while I give some advice to those who would love to go for a trip and, well, let a friend of mine relate her experiences in that field. I think it is a human document in this way and probably tells the story more efficiently than I ever could. Two girls wanted to see the Gaspe Peninsula. Two girls had a modest budget, a car, a small dog. Two girls decided it would be a camping expedition. The decision seemed pretty terrific, but we, were, but we only knew that camping meant a tent put up in some lonely spot and smudged pots over a fire which never really burned pleasantly except when built by trappers and Indians. We were both a little timid too, not being exactly any Oakleys, but we had the spirit of adventure and some determination in common, so we decided to go. We found a fatherly person in charge of the department in the shop where most people go for camping equipment. We listened carefully to his advice, take only the very lightest equipment, even it can become heavy. Take the minimum, no fancy gadgets, just the things which will make you as comfortable as though you were sleeping in your own bed. Well, here's what they bought. Uh, and a list of stuff. Um, this book is extremely sexist. <laughs> and unsurprisingly, terminology is the terminology that would have been common in the early 1940s. Uh, or in this case, I guess it's updated to the late 1940s, but still not exactly what we would use today. Uh, cooking outdoors on a terrace. Drinks and appetizers out of doors. Starts off with some alcoholic beverages. We get a mint julep up front, uh, and then a Tom Collins and a Cuba Libre, and some planter's punch. Uh, oh, and then a zombie, a slow gin fizz, gin and tonic, spritzer, vermouth and soda. I can read any of these if you would like me to. Just toss it in the chat, and I will stop and read one. Um, Aunt Sophronia's Delight. Use a large crystal or silver punch bowl for this drink and have plenty of liquor on hand. Slice fresh peaches into a glass dish and cover with sugar and white wine. For 12 peaches, two cups white wine and three tablespoons sugar. Allow them to stand for two or three hours. In another bowl, have some of the freshest and loveliest strawberries you have ever seen ready to do guard duty at a moment's notice and don't hull them. Ice the punch bowl and leave a goodly chunk of ice in it. Pour the peaches and wine over the ice and fill the bowl with chilled champagne. Float some strawberries in this and have glasses and ladle ready to take the thirst from the guests. Have reserves of champagne and of prepared peaches. To 12 peaches, I should say two quarts of champagne. Interesting. I wonder who Aunt Sophronia was. 
Um, appetizers, soups. We have an Oregon clam chowder, two cups of minced razor clams, two cups of potatoes in cubes, a quarter pound of bacon or salt pork, one quart of milk, one medium onion chopped fine, and salt and pepper. Boil the potatoes in a small amount of water for about 10 minutes or until they be are medium soft. Cut the bacon or salt pork in thin strips and try out. Add the onion and brown slightly in the fat. Add the milk and potatoes with the water they were cooked in and heat slowly. Lastly, add the clams and allow to come to the boiling point, but not past it. Salt and pepper to taste, serve at once. I make this in a deep iron skillet of Dutch or Dutch oven or in a casserole of French pottery. So we have three different clam chowders. We have the Oregon clam chowder, we have clam chowder, and then we have Manhattan clam chowder. Um, this is the first time I've seen the Manhattan clam chowder in the book, but it is at least a variety of chowder that I'm, a, I'm familiar with. Uh, notes on grills, broilers, meats, and cooking. No matter how well schooled you may be in buying meat for the family, I am sure you have found or will find that the outdoor stove presents a different problem in many ways. I am listing for your convenience the various cuts I find the most successful and the average cooking time per pound, which seems to be the norm for spitted cooking. And none of them are yet uh, the clam chowder that Hannah makes every year. I'm very curious if we will ever find the correct clam chowder. Beef you want well aged, well marbled with flaky creamy white fat and deep cherry red color when cut. Prime rib, sirloin roast, top round, and tenderloin are recommended for roasting. Uh, and for steaks, either sirloin, porterhouse, or tenderloin. For steak sandwiches, tenderloin, shell, or club. I, those are terms that I'm not familiar with. I, I know tenderloin. I don't know shell or club. Rump or top sirloin are the cuts. I, I, I've never heard the terms shell or club in relation to cuts of beef. That is new to me. I don't know what that means. Veal, shoulder or calves liver, leg of lamb, shoulder or forequarter, saddle, stuffed breast, liver, So various cuts of meat being recommended. Chickens, ducks, geese, pheasant, grouse, partridge, quail, plover, venison, bear meat, etc. I feel very definitively that venison should be hung for about three or four weeks. Well, I actually want to just know about what are you saying about bear meat? Tell me about the bear meat. Because that's the first time I've seen it mentioned in any of the books we've looked at. But it's in the title, and I don't see it in the actual, like, I guess, yeah, he do, like, it's in the title, but it doesn't show up anywhere in the actual text, the bear meat. Game in the goo? I choose to express the following type of cookery this way, for to me it immediately brings to mind a most expressive picture. It is an efficient way of cooking any sort of bird in the open and even in your own garden if you have a real pit for cooking. You dig a pit about three feet deep and perhaps three feet by three feet or smaller, as the case may be, line it well with large stones and build a healthy fire in it. Slit your birds and draw them, leaving the feathers on if you wish. You may stuff the birds or you may fill the cavity of each with an apple or a half orange or some herbs. 
Now roll the bird in clay or thick, heavy mud till it is entirely covered with a good, thick coat, and none of the bird is showing. Draw the coals from the pit and line it with damp leaves or fern. Place the birds on the leaves and cover with another layer of ferns or leaves. Now cover them well with coals and let them cook until the clay or mud is entirely dried out. Split the clay and the feathers will come off, leaving your birds ready for the table or the fist, as the case may be. If you don't want to go to the trouble of digging a pit, you may roast the gooey birds in the ashes of a fire or on a portable grill till they dry out completely. Somehow or other, this does things to flavor the birds, to, to the flavor of the birds too. It gives just cause for much smacking of the lips and brings on increasingly large appetites. Green salad here, crisp bread and a throat awash with good wine. Mmm. Cucumbers with cream, pickled salmon, clam bake, paella, chipino, bouillabaisse, moru, notes on grilling or broiling, steak, marinated steak. There's a lot of narrative in this book. It's, it's more narrative than actual, like, recipes. Let's see what we've got. Tamale pie. Salt pork dinner. Scallopini. Interesting. Uh, breakfast. Can't, uh, like, oh, a section on picnicking. Cold entrees, sandwiches. I'm looking at the index now. Because I, I do want to not spend all of our time on this one book, but it's the first one that we've had that seems like it's an actual, like, outdoor cookbook as opposed to being a camping cookbook. And it specifically says in the beginning that it is not a camping cookbook before providing some information on how to prepare to go camping. Um, but everything before that that we've seen was all focused on camping. So next I have Come and Get It. Outdoor cooking and outdoor eating will always have its appeal. In this new book, you will find menus, recipes, ideas that will fit all kinds of gatherings, large or small, whether you want to have a feast in your own backyard for a few friends, or whether you want to plan a club picnic. You will find explicit instructions on how to make your gathering an outstanding success by George W. Martin, author of The Modern Camping Guide, The Complete Outdoor Chef. Uh, so this one is from 1942. So this is uh, right after the U.S. enters World War II. And this was published in, sorry, uh, this was New York. <clears throat> Again, starting with how to make your fireplace. Uh, and then different stoves, outdoor stoves, first aid. Only I don't think it's first aid. I think it's it says first aids for the cook, but then the Topical sections, I think, is tools. And then meats, fowl, fish, shellfish, eggs, gravies, etc. Hunter's specials. A page about bear. Small game, rabbit, squirrel, porcupine, skunk. Okay. Hi, Chard Monster. <laughs> um, so th this one here is called The Complete Outdoor Chef. It's from 1942. 
um, the one we were looking at before was uh, James Beard Cook It Outdoors. I don't know exactly when you got here. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna flip to 177 because we saw a skunk recipe last week um, that was quite interesting, and so I have to see what this book says about skunk. In its wild state, the wood pussy is a much, rep much respected member of society whose defense fumes enable him to avoid unwanted company. However, his meat will furnish the raw material for a fairly good meal. In dressing a skunk, you must obviously remove the scent glands. The meat should then be parboiled or and oven or pot roasted. So actually a lot less detail than the camping cookbook that we looked at last week. <laughs> yes, um, that is what it says, wood pussy. I'm guessing referring to like cats. So 1942 pussy would have been a common term used for cats. Um, but uh, yeah, I've never heard a skunk referred to with that terminology before. <laughs> um, so that's in the hunter's specials section, uh, which is going to be talking about like all the game that you could catch if you were out hunting yourself. Um, but I, again, with starting off with telling you how to build a fireplace, um, which is good information, but also much more extensive than I ever would have done on my own if I was out camping. Um, although these look much more rudimentary in the, their illustrations, boulder fireplace, rock fireplace, reflector fire, trench. And then a section specifically labeled permanent fireplaces. Once you have become an addict of outdoor cooking, whether in conjunction with camp life or as a re recreation in your suburban home, you will find that you must give occasional vent to your gastronomical urge for broiled steak or other food prepared by the open fire. You will then probably come to the conclusion that you need some sort of permanent open cooking location with proper facilities, and undoubtedly you will visualize a fireplace. Possibly it is to be homemade, and this you can do in as little time as a few hours if you keep it simple enough. But if you are willing to devote a weekend or two to the job, you can produce a good-looking, well-furnished structure which will stand through the years to come. Um, advice on location, and then some of the similar constructions to what we've seen before in some of the other books. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on building fireplaces, but uh, that's the, f so this is again sort of transitional um, because the, what, the last ones that we looked at last week were 1934. Um, was kind of the last timing because uh, the Boy Scout one was in the 40s and um, so the last one that we looked at really was 1934 and then less than a decade later with the James Beard book in 1941 we're already talking about suburban backyards for cooking so some, sometime between 34 and 41 the idea of outdoor cooking, not just being camping, but also being for suburban life had taken hold. Um, and we're starting to see books that are like transitional between how you cook for camping and how you cook in your backyard. So that's interesting. Outdoor stoves and grills, gas stoves. Also, these books seem to have less ads baked into them. Because <laughs> if you remember last week, a lot of the books uh, were just big ads. Um, I'm sure we'll come across some more. First aids for the cook. <clears throat> this chapter has little to do with your getting hurt, except that if you will digest some of the suggestions, you may prevent burned fingers, strained backs, and hot tempers. Let us briefly review some of the more useful outdoor fireplace equipment and accessories. 
<laughs> Among the more important items is a pair of gloves. You may think that a pot grabber or a big red bandana will do as well. It won't. Get a pair of the heaviest kind of all canvas gloves at a, gloves at a workman's clothing store. Wear them to handle your pots over the fire to move the grate or to put on more fuel. You will then not only prevent blisters, but you will also keep your hands cleaner and the gloves are more amenable to washing with soap and water. But do not use leather gloves as they shrink when subjected to heat. Asbestos gloves may also be had. And with these, you can literally pick up and juggle live coals. Except don't use asbestos. This is before we knew that asbestos was not a thing you should use. Um, <laughs> yeah, cancer gloves, <laughs> geek outs. <laughs> but at the time, asbestos was very popular for insulating applications. And um, probably would have been very effective. The problem is the asbestos fibers breaking down and getting in your lungs. Um, not so much the application of it. So let's see. What do we got? What do we got? I want to see favorite camp and outdoor meat dishes. Broiled steak. Yeah. Um, the library that uh, here on Tex campus had had some asbestos remediation a couple of years ago uh, when they were remodeling one of the floors. Because um, a lot of the buildings here on campus are old enough that they had asbestos used in them. I'm going to see. Again, we've got sections talking about topics, but not really giving recipes uh, or instruction. Some information on deep fat frying a fish, broiling fish. Yeah, so Key Squared uh, in the chat saying, you still use asbestos gloves at work. They're handy around molten metal and liquid nitrogen, not so much for general campfire cooking. Um, they definitely still have application, and as long as they're used safely, it's fine. The way they were used for building insulation um, was one of the contributing factors to them causing uh, things like mesothelioma, et cetera, and, and that has to do with the, the way the fibers were structured for home insulation and the breakdown and ability for those to get into the air and circulate and then get into your lungs, which is where the medical problems come in. But if they're used in a proper application where that isn't going to be a concern and they're fully sealed up, say, like inside of gloves, um, I could definitely see how they could be useful in certain applications, but it would still be I think limited use in very protected uh, settings as opposed to just buying them at, lo at your local hardware store. Bread. Bread for outdoor cooking. Although practically a forgotten art among the present day recreational campers, making sourdough bread is nevertheless a method worth knowing if for no other reason than to enjoy a change from the usual camp baking powder, biscuit, loaves, and pancakes. For sourdough is suitable not only for bread, but for rolls and pancakes as well. Use the following ingredients to start the necessary fermentation of your sourdough. Four cups of flour, two teaspoons of salt, three tablespoons of sugar, four cups of warm water, approximately. To the mixed dry ingredients, stir enough warm water to form a thick batter. This will probably expand to double or more of its original volume during the process of fermentation. So use a crock or a pot of sufficient size. Cover loosely and place behind the stove next to the fire or in the sun. A temperature of about 90 degrees is the most favorable for this type of bacterial growth. Allow at least 48 hours for the necessary fermentation to take place, during which time the mixture should develop a characteristic unpleasant odor, which will entirely disappear during the subsequent baking process. 
If you intend making only one batch of bread or pancakes, use olive mixture. Otherwise, save about a cup each time, replenishing the amount removed by stirring in more flour and water. The mixture tends to improve with time, and once the proper fermentation is underway, a small part of the sourdough will be sufficient to thoroughly sour overnight uh, the added flour and water. So that sounds very similar to just like starting a, um, your own sourdough starter that you would use to make breads and things at home, which a lot of people learned to do over the last year as people uh, ended up inside and it was harder to get bread at your local grocer. Uh, yes, Geek Outs. Those gloves are probably properly disposed of um, before the materials break down. <clears throat> Jams and jellies, shortcakes, fruits and dumplings. So because this is still very much like a camping book, um, like it's got, it's transitional as I said, it has this hunter's section. <clears throat> Talks about what to do with a deer and then how to cook deer meat. Deer, elk, moose, and other members of the deer family are all cooked alike. Moose, because of its coarse grain, is last on the list of gastronomical preferences. Care must be taken to not overcook venison, which should always be on the rare side. In roasting large pieces, allow about 15 minutes to the pound. Bear. So we want to, the James Beard book had a section, had a paragraph labeled, and, and bear was in the name. It said venison, bear, etc. And then they never talked about bear. So this is the first time we get some information on how to cook bear. Uh, it is surely surprising to think of the number of hunters, including real woodsmen, who turn up their noses at bear meat. An old one, to be sure, will be gamey and tough, but so is an old buck. Even such delicacy as roasted pheasant's breast, if from an ancient bird, will defy the efficacy of the strongest human molars. Consider, however, a yearling black bear, especially one who has been feeding on such choice morsels as blueberries, choke cherries, and beech nuts. His meat, properly prepared, will hardly be more wild in taste than that of a hare. <laughs> Sorry, the rhyming in this is just getting to me. <laughs> okay. Consider, however, a yearling black bear, especially one who has been feeding on such choice morsels as blueberries, choke cherries, and beech nuts. His meat properly prepared will hardly be more wild in taste than that of a hare. Compared to venison, a young bear is by far superior to a sinewy buck who has roamed the hills for many a winter. As a hunter, you will first be concerned with dressing and skinning your game, remove the entrails exactly as you would with deer, then hang the carcass head up for a period of several days to two weeks, depending on the temperature, to allow the necessary aging process to take place. The liver, however, may be eaten the day the animal is shot. The, an exception is the liver of a polar bear, which is said to be poisonous. I guess that's an important exception to note. A bear hide is a highly prized article. Cutting up for cooking will be no different than that of a deer. As to cooking bear meat, one general rule is applicable always, is applicable always. Namely, it must be thoroughly done. If served slightly rare, the flavor will be too gamey for the average taste. Huh. Generally agreed that bear meat is at its best when roasted. Plenty of gravy is needed, because the meat is dry. Oh, I, it, oh, interesting, okay. Ooh, fun fact from Geek Outs. Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, and Vermont each allow bear hunting. Rhode Island and Connecticut do not. In the states allowing bear hunting, bear hunters need to obtain a state permit. Bear hunting season generally occurs in the fall, but specific dates vary by location and hunting method. 
Interesting. It's also interesting that Rhode Island and Connecticut don't allow it uh, when all of the, basically the rest of New England does. Around here in Virginia, I don't know about bear hunting. I know most hunting in this area is deer hunting. Um, but otherwise I'm not, I, I've never gone hunting myself, so I'm not familiar. Um, this to me is really interesting. This, this section on rabbit here and the way it starts. Rabbits and hares have in recent years received a good deal of adverse publicity because of a disease known as Tulamaria, transmitted to man largely but not solely through these animals. The malady cannot be recognized by vis usual visual means, but it is a safe precaution not to shoot rabbits acting abnormally languid or to wear rubberized gloves when handling the uncooked meat. Thoroughly cooked meat, however, is perfectly safe and therefore one need not be deterred from hunting this abundant game. So, <clears throat> I actually really enjoy rabbit as uh, a protein for cooking. Like, I, I enjoy it a lot, but it's really hard to find. And I'm curious if that is because of adverse publicity related to tulamaria. I wonder if that's why it's not generally a part of our diet today. Because rabbit was definitely something that was eaten in Europe for a long time, as well as here in the U.S. Um, so this might be an indication of why we don't see it so much in our supermarkets. Um, <clears throat> I love this note. Squirrel. Squirrels are cooked exactly like rabbit, allowing proportionately less time. Young animals are excellent spread out and broiled. Older ones, however, are best stewed, along with the liver, heart, and kidneys, and eaten with dumplings. I've never had squirrel, but many of the rabbit recipes that I've seen have noted that you could use squirrel meat instead of rabbit. Your dad said that the only time you can hunt rabbits is in the late fall or winter in West Texas to avoid disease. Yeah, the only rabbits that I've ever had were um, generally from a, a butcher's freezer, like not even fresh rabbit meat, and they were farmed, uh, specifically like bred to be sold to butchers. Um, and occasionally around here, the, the grocer's freezer will have them here, um, just like a box of rabbit meat. Um, so I get to have my Haas and Pfeffer and other like rabbit dishes. <clears throat> Porcupine, woodchuck, opossum, raccoon, uh, noted here as coon. Uh, in this, I think the first time I ever had rabbit geek outs was, um, from a butcher in Minneapolis and theirs were farmed, uh, on a farm in Wisconsin, specifically for uh, selling rabbit meat for people to eat. So, um, raccoon, in this case, it is suggested that the that only the young, recognizable by their size, be saved for the table. Remove the glands as directed for a possum and prepare for eating in much the same manner. I know possum, I've never heard of anybody eating raccoon. <laughs> uh, yeah, probably less gamey for a farmed one. I don't know. I've never had wild rabbit, so I, I, I couldn't compare. Um, to me, I thought rabbit meat, rabbit meat tastes surprisingly like turkey. It doesn't taste like chicken. Everybody says everything tastes like chicken. Rabbit does not. I would say rabbit is closer to turkey. Anyway, that was a 1942 outdoor cookbook. Uh, again, Lots of camping in there. Um, let's see. What's the next one I have? I have one here called Cooking Out of Doors from 1946. And we've got a girl holding a bunch of sticks. And 
Uh, looks like a cook pot hanging over a fire. I wonder if this is another Girl Scout book. It is. Um, apparently, this was owned by Mrs. J.E. Stenroos of Ashtabula, Ohio. Um, cooking out of doors, fire building, outdoor kitchens, cookout hikes, food planning recipes, illustrations by Sharon F. Mellis, uh, Melick, Girl Scouts of the United States of America. Copyright 1946. I still find it amazing that both of the Girl Scout books that we've found so far were copyright the Girl Scouts. The Boy Scout book was copyright uh, the Kellogg's Company. And had a lot of advertisements for Kellogg's cereal. Um, Cooking Out of Doors, a complete revision of Woodland Cookery, is planned to be a guide for all who would take to the trail and stop along the way for a hiker's snack or a woodland feast. Basic information on ways of building fires, kinds of fuel, methods of food care, progressive menus, and cookouts have been included for new troops that are just beginning to explore the adventure of cooking out. Experienced troops will improve their skill by using the advanced techniques and recipes found in these pages. So, we've done a lot of looking at camping stuff. I don't want to linger too much on camping because we spent a lot of time on camping last week. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I hope so. Yes, okay, thank you. The, uh, the batteries died in the, in the mic, so. I didn't expect that because when I turned it on it had two bars still and that's usually enough, but I guess it was reading incorrectly. Uh, anyway, I was commenting on, like, uh, I read the eggnog recipe in here um, and commented on how the Girl Scouts book included lots of information about exactly what to pack for uh, a week away at camp and very practical information 
the recipes are things you can make with what they suggested that you pack, uh, etc. <laughs> yeah, there is a bit of a delay between the captions and the audio, and there's not a lot I can do to correct that, but um, let's see. So this is really, really similar to the other Girl Scout book that we looked at last week, so I'm not going to linger on it too much. I want to look, um, the next one is 1950, and um, I mean, the Girl Scout book, obviously designed for camping, um, but the next one is Enjoy Outdoor Cookery in Your Own Backyard. So this is the gold. This is what we're looking for. And we have a book that is specifically talking about our topic, which is backyard grilling. Um, so it's a small one that we've got just in a little envelope so it doesn't get lost too easily. You may re recognize the illustration on the front that I used for the uh, um, promotional image last week for week one. Uh, enjoy outdoor cookery in your own backyard. And so we've got a, a kind of a fold out thing here. Um, you open it up and it's recipes from Hudson's Home Advisory Bureau. Grilled steak, marinated steak, roasted corn, the bean pot, meat on skewers, grilled hamburgers, gourmet hamburger, gourmet's hamburger, California hamburgers, beef stew. This is the first time that we've seen hamburgers mentioned. Everything else was talking about steaks and uh, stuff like that, but never really talking about ground beef in any way. Um, but here we are with one that's specifically targeted to backyard cooking and the hamburger has appeared. Hudson's Barbecue Shop. Neath the spreading chestnut tree, the amateur chef he stands, cooking outdoors, having fun, fork and spatula in his hands. The point is, there's good eating and good fun to be had under open skies, and most everyone, 6 to 60, wants to pitch in and help. So, Hudson's 10th floor offers this list of equipment for mother, father, and junior to simplify your outdoor living, whether on the terrace, on tour, or just camping. But apparently just for mother, father, and junior, not for the daughter of the house. Um, during May, classes in outdoor cooking will be conducted by men chefs at Hudson's Home Advisory Bureau. For serving simply, for cooking easily. So this is a, this is an ad. Um, this entire thing is an ad for Hudson's Barbecue Shop. Just for comfort, equipment for tour by boat or car. goulash chicken barbecue sauce. So I want to look at the hamburger recipe because we haven't really seen a hamburger recipe this entire time. Um, like, it's been an episode and a half that we've been digging into this. Product placement count two. Yes, you are correct, Lord Portico. Um, grilled hamburgers. Two pounds ground beef, one cup bread crumbs, cracker crumbs or cereal, two tablespoons of chopped onion, one teaspoon of pepper, one tablespoon chili sauce, two eggs, a half a cup of milk, and one teaspoon of salt. Mix the bread crumbs, which have been softened in the milk, the onion, and the eggs. Add the seasonings and ground beef. Divide into patties about six, half to three quarter inch thick, grill over coals. So honestly, that couldn't be simpler. That is the classic, basic hamburger patty recipe with the breadcrumbs and the meat and the eggs as a binder. I don't know how much more basic of a hamburger recipe you can get. <laughs> Hannah, I mean, it does sound good. It sounds 
like I was just saying, it sounds like a standard hamburger recipe. This is this is the go-to absolute basic core fundamentals of cooking hamburger patty recipe. Um, and there's probably a reason that it is the classic original. It is simple and it's effective. So then they have that gourmet version, which is one pound of ground steak instead of ground beef. Um, <clears throat> two tablespoons of heavy cream, a tablespoon of onion juice, and salt and pepper. Uh, apparently California hamburgers are chopped meat instead of ground meat, uh, pepper, sage, salt, thyme, and onion juice. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it, it's got the sage and the thyme and chopped meat instead of ground. And that's, otherwise it's basically the same. Like I've heard of a California burger uh, and the California burger is generally with mayonnaise instead of ketchup and mustard. It's generally um, like lettuce, tomato, and mayo as toppings, sometimes avocado. Um, but that's what I've heard referred to as a California burger before. Uh, this is ac actually a change in the actual formulation of the patty itself. So this one is called Let's Eat Outdoors, a cookbook of recipes and ideas for picnics, barbecues, patio parties, camping. Uh, and it is also from 1950. Um, here, instead of line art illustrations, we have uh, actual photograph. Um, it looks like staged f photographs, like a, a food um, food photography designer like laid out a table just for photographing or something. Oh, uh, yeah, Memphis style. Let's. So I'm not 100% sure what a Memphis-style burger would be. I've heard that term, but I'm not certain. My brain immediately went to like a barbecue pulled pork sandwich with coleslaw on it, which is not a Memphis-style burger. I don't know what a Memphis-style burger is. So enlighten me if you know, because I'm not familiar. Um, yes, indeed, they have a loaf of Spam Um, it looks like they've got some sort of cake that's been made in a, in the cast iron skillet and they've got various cookies and, um, not a hamburger to be seen in the picture there. Um, we've got a few ads here, Portico, uh, dairy foods, blueberry trail biscuits, uh, that Definitely show Betty Crocker Bisquick, um, Van Camp's Pork and Beans, Hormel Franks and Hormel Chili, Caro Syrup. Um, we've got McCormick Seasonings and I cannot think off the top of my head. I recognize the S, but I can't think of what the brand is. Um, we have a Coleman stove, Nescafe instant coffee, and Nest Tea instant tea. Wow. So we got lots of, lots of product placement in this one. Memphis style burgers are a burger topped with the usual toppings and then add coleslaw. Okay. Uh, one version that you had was pulled pork and coleslaw. So, I mean, because Memphis style to me was a pulled pork sandwich with coleslaw on it. So that does make sense for a Memphis style burger to just have a burger that is add the coleslaw or add both pulled pork and coleslaw. Um, Milk Coolers Bean Time USA Chicken Barbecue, New Ways with Franks, Spicy Sausages, Outdoor Flapjacks, Butter Burgers, 
camping out, outdoor serving, refreshing drinks, new appetizers, and cakes. 28 pages of recipes and ideas for outdoor eating. Yours to enjoy. The year's best ideas in outdoor eating by nine famous names. Backyard barbecue or picnic in the country. The American Dairy Association suggests dairy foods to make it a better meal outdoors. Milk coolers for outdoor fun. Lemon refresher, raspberry flip, calypso cooler, maple nut milk. Uh... Oh, and then we get to bean time. A raspberry flip. To one quart of thoroughly chilled milk, add one cup of Stokely's Red Raspberry Preserves. Stir thir thoroughly. Serve at once. <laughs> oh, oh, wow. Oh, I'm going to read this one. Maple nut milk. Before the barbecue or picnic, beat together one quart of milk, one cup caro maple lee syrup, half a cup of creamy peanut butter, one teaspoon of McCormick shilling maple flavoring. Chill and carry in cooler. So not only do you not use maple syrup, you also add maple flavoring. Because the reason it is called Cairo Maple Lee syrup is that it is not maple syrup. It is syrup that is flavored to taste like maple syrup. Oh, 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 wow. And we're not even into the 70s and the horribleness that is the 70s for cuisine. We will get there. I promise. <laughs> um... So we get Van Camp's pork and beans. It's bean time, USA. When it's picnic time, more porch patio and picnic meals include Van Camp's pork and beans than any other brand. The secret savory sauce is cooked in just heat. Or the secret savory sauce is cooked in. Just heat, eat, enjoy. But for variety, try these special recipes for extra delicious taste treats. Beanie Weenies Western style. Super Hobo Beans, Baked Beans Deluxe, Bean Burgers, Patio Chops and Beans, and Beans Hawaiian Style. Salad Oil? Um, I think so, Hannah. I think salad oil would just be the, the, the olive oil that typically gets, because you mix olive oil and vinegar for like oil and vinegar salad dressing. I think it's just olive oil. And you are right, it is in the Beanie Weenies recipe. A tablespoon of salad oil. Interesting. What are bean burgers? Because they're not veggie burgers. This is the 1950s, or this is literally 1950. Half a pound of ground beef, one tablespoon of salad oil, half a teaspoon of salt, half a tea, or eighth a teaspoon of McCormick shilling pepper, third cup of sliced green onions, one can Van Camp's pork and beans drained, half a cup of Stokely's or Van Camp's ketchup, and eight round buns. Brown the meat in the oil in a large skillet, add salt, pepper, and sliced onion. Cook slowly until well done. Add pork and beans and ketchup. Heat. Spoon into sandwich buns. So you're not even making a patty out of it. That's just like a bean. I mean, that's like a, a sloppy joe with beans in the mix. Yeah, today I would think it was a vegetarian burger, but no, like, and <clears throat> the, according to the instructions, you're not even making a patty out of the meat. So that's, that's what I was just looking at. Like, it sounds more like a, um, like a sloppy joe preparation that just uses, like you, you've got beans mixed in with the, uh, the ground meat. 
Garden fresh pickles for more picnic pleasure. Stokely's finest pickles from the heart of America's farmlands. Perfect partner for outdoor meals. Look for the wide variety in Stokely's dist distinctive square jars with twist-off caps. Bean salad, tuna salad, jellied saladettes. Oh my gosh, it's 1950 and we've already got a jello salad. Jellied saladettes. A salad fit for a feast. One package lemon flavored gelatin, one can Stokely's saladettes drained. One teaspoon Stokely's finest sweet pickles chopped. Quarter cup of Stokely's finest pitted ripe olives sliced. Dissolve gelatin. Following package directions, chill until partially set. Add remaining ingredients, chill until firm. For picnics, chill right in Dixie cups. Serve with garlic butter sticks. Gotta love those savory sweet jello concoctions that I was referring to a moment ago by talking about the horrors of the 1970s. This is 1950 and we've got a jello salad treat that is olives and sweet pickles in lemon jello that they suggest serving with a garlic butter stick. <laughs> that is, um, that is a concoction. <laughs> oh boy, it doesn't sound good to me. Saladettes are now basically a refrigerated salad bar. Interesting. I'm just gonna turn the page. I'm, I don't wanna look at that one anymore. Let's eat outdoors with the one and only Spam. I'll meet Hormel Franks. I'm confused. I think that might be, it's written as though that is a complete sentence, but Spam. I think this is two separate things. We've got Spam and we've got Hormel Franks. The buffet of salads. Uh, Lord Portico, this whole book is product placement. <laughs> um, yeah, Spam... Not healthy for you, but not absolutely horrible. It's really salty. Um, commonly used in a lot of modern Hawaiian cuisine. So, fun on a bun. Grind together one loaf of spam, one small onion, and a half a pound of cheddar cheese. Stir in condensed mushroom soup to moisten. Scoop out soft centers of buns, fill with mixture. Heat, foil wrapped in oven or on a grill. Barbecued Spam, Spamaroni picnic salad. Paul Bunyan sandwich. Yeah, Spam and pineapple, because you need the acidity and sweetness of the pineapple to cut the um, smoky, salty flavor of the Spam. So that's why they pair together really well. Um, cause it's really heavily salted and smoked, uh, and the acidity and the sweetness from the pineapple pairs really well together with the smoky, salty flavor of the Spam. But if you take the Spam and you, you can fry it up like you would like sausages for like breakfast sausages or something like that, um, and just serve it alongside something else, otherwise it goes into various preparations. But yeah, if you look for a lot of, if you wanna try a good Spam recipe, I would suggest looking into Hawaiian uh, recipes, Hawaiian cuisine recipes, because um, modern Hawaiian cuisine incorporates a lot of Spam and they do it really well. Um, how to add exciting taste with McCormick Schilling, the uh, spices and seasonings. Caro syrup makes all flapjacks outdoor good. Um, this is an interesting change for me. So Caro syrup is still around today. This brand still exists and it, it tends to sell um, 
light and dark corn syrup that are used as ingredients and other things. But here, it's actually being advertised as like a syrup that you would just pour on pancakes or they have you pouring mapley green label or dark rich blue label caro onto ice cream or pudding. Um, whereas today, caro doesn't typically advertise or market a syrup that is meant to be as a topping. Their syrups are in the baking aisle and are meant to be used as ingredients in other things that you make. Um, you used caro syrup to make fake blood. Yeah, it's, um, it, it's an ingredient for things. It's not generally thought of as like a topping, but here it's, it's being used as a topping. Butter burgers. This I, I have to read this one just because if you're if you've ever heard the term butter burgers, um, it is a, a trademark for the Culver's fast food chain, um, and so the fact that it was in quotation marks at the beginning of this book and it's mentioned here. I don't think that this is going to be any relation to Culver's, but I just, it caught my attention because that is a trademarked term for Culver's fast food chain, uh, butter burgers. Uh, before the outdoor meal mix, at, uh, before the outdoor meal, mix at home three tablespoons milk, one egg, three quarters teaspoon dry mustard, three quarters teaspoon salt, one eighth teaspoon McCormick's black pepper, one teaspoon Worcestershire sauce, three tablespoons real butter, melted, uh, beat with rotary beater, add one pound lean ground beef, mix thoroughly, shape into four large hamburgers, chill, take to barbecue in Coleman cooler, heat skillet over low heat on Coleman stove, uh, or over low coals, melt three tablespoons real butter in skillet, Brown burgers on both sides until done. Brush buns with skillet drippings. Toast. Serve burgers on buns. Butter burgers are really juicy. Interesting. Oh, wait. The caro syrup is opti optically active. If you look at it through a polarizing filter, it changes colors as you rotate the polarizer. <laughs> Learning that did not increase your desire to eat it. <laughs> Though you make an exception for pecan pie. Um, I mean, you don't have to use caro syrup to make something like that. It just makes it a lot easier to make a pecan pie. And here we have a layout that is full on ad. We have a food stylist who has laid out a table um, to, to create this image. And then every item on the table is labeled um, by what it is. So number one over here, we have Long John Soda. Uh, two is a Vagabond Shortcake. Three are Fresh Green Pickles. Four is a Spamaroni Picnic Salad. Uh, five is Nippy Cheese Dip. Six is Cheese Beanies. Seven is Cold Refreshing Milk. Uh, eight is Shortcut Salad. And nine are Saucy Dogs. Um, this picture being put together by the American Dairy Association of Chicago. Uh, and I bet if you go to each of those pages and look at those recipes, they are all advertising specific brand names of foods. Here we have a layout talking about the Coleman grill and cooler and uh, all of the, some recipes there that will direct you to use Coleman products. <clears throat> Dixie cups, which we already had mentioned in that Jello recipe. Uh, clearly, they were a sponsor for this. Nestle's Tasty Treats for Outdoor Fun. Um, 
Nescafe Coffee, Cinnamon Swizzle, Cafe Cuba, Chocolate Pops, Hawaiian Pineapple Cake for a Crowd. Interesting. I was wait I was looking to see if there would be a mention of s'mores. I don't know when s'mores were invented. Um, and there is no mention of s'mores in here for outdoor cooking uh, in this page about chocolate. So I don't know if Kira's watching today, but if she was, she could probably tell me when s'mores came into being. <clears throat> Bisquick. Lots of brand names that we're still familiar with today. Betty Crocker. Easy Summer Tricks with Betty Crocker Cake Mix and Betty Crocker Frosting Mix. And honestly, like these are these are products that you can still buy today. That is uh, like this is in 1950s. Here are some ideas for outdoor eating. And a lot of these products are still on your grocery store uh, shelves today, like Spam. You can easily find Spam. You can find McCormick Spices. You can find uh, Dixie Cups and Bisquick, Betty Crocker Cake Mixes, Van Camp's Pork and Beans, Caro Syrup, uh, Nestle's Quick, Coleman Stoves. Like all of these products have survived and are in our grocery stores today. Um, from Geek Outs. Though the exact date s'mores were invented remains a mystery. The first formal recipe for the treat, then called some mores, is recorded in the 1927 cookbook, or 27 book, Tramping and Trailing with the Girl Scouts. The original recipe calls for 16 graham crackers, 16 marshmallows, and eight bars of chocolate broken in two. Thank you, Geek Outs. I don't know if we, I. I don't know if we have that book. If we do, it didn't make it onto my uh, my pull cart for this series. Um, it definitely sounds like a book that we would absolutely include in the collection if uh, if we came across it. Here we have 19, another 1950. Oh, wait, no, it's the same book. <laughs> Let's Eat Outdoors, 1950. Um, that's the same thing we just looked at, so we'll just put that on there. The Art of Grilling, Baking, Barbecuing, 1952. So we advance by two more years. And we have... The kitchen of Duncan Hines's home centers around the RCA estate range. The art of grilling, baking, barbecuing. Plus 12 of Duncan Hines' all-time favorite recipes. The Duncan Hines home of Bowling Green, Kentucky. Duncan Hines. The nation's foremost authority on good food. The name Duncan Hines is an American household word. Throughout the entire nation, it has become synonymous with the art of gracious living, with good food, good lodging, and good taste. His is a unique avocation that has grown out of the quiet, simple fastidiousness of a man who compiled for the personal comfort and convenience of himself and his wife, a list of good eating places along the highways of America. It was natural and inevitable that friends and acquaintances should consult the Hines on their list before setting out on a trip. Requests for copies of the Duncan Hines list became so numerous that the only logical solution was to public, publish it in book form and thus make it available to the general public. Today, the Duncan Hines books are a must with everyone who travels, for business or pleasure. They are as essential as a roadmap or timetable and infinitely more enjoyable reading. His recommendation sign on hotels, motels, and restaurants is a dependable endorsement for travelers from coast to coast. I had no idea 
I only know Duncan Hines as a brand name. I had no idea he published travel guides with recommendations on places to eat. Huh. Food preparation guide, the art of cooking. The art of using an RCA estate. <laughs> so we have the art of cooking followed by the art of using this specific model of stove and oven. The art of grilling. Okay, a mixed grilled dinner. Grilled lamb chops with bacon and sausages, honey glazed sweet potatoes, grilled pineapple slices with mint jelly. Grilled hamburger with grilled onion slices. French toast with orange marmalade and grilled sausages. A Duncan Hines favorite recipe, fresh pork sausage. That is a frightening illustration of the pig with the shirt on next to the recipe for fresh pork sausage. English muffins, hotcakes, crepe sousettes, the art of barbecuing. <clears throat> bar b -cure meat oven. Here's what you do your meats here's here's where you do your meats in an RCA estate range and never anywhere with any other method will you find the tender, juicy, downright goodness of meats cooked with this radiant charcoal type heat. Here is the most important range development in the past 20 years. The most copied feature in our range industry, or in the range industry. Not only does your bar be cure solve your number one mealtime problem of getting everything ready at once, because it lets you do roasts and oven baking at the same time, but it uses the modern low temperature method recommended by the National Livestock and Meat Board and other meat authorities to retain natural, savory juices and reduce shrinkage. If you do not own an RCA estate barbecuer range, you will broil flat cuts of meat in your conventional uh, below oven broiler, unless you're so fortunate as to own a high broiler model. Roasts, hams, and chickens you will cook in your own oven, rather than in the barbecuer meat oven according to the usual technique for roasting. So I, oh, that last paragraph was less advertisement and more Here's how you use the recipes we're giving you if you don't have one of these amazing pieces of technology. Um, I find it really interesting that it says, uh, you will uh, never anywhere with any other method will you find the tender, juicy, downright goodness of meats cooked with this radiant charcoal type heat. Uh, so not, not actual charcoal, just charcoal type heat. Um, and I definitely can tell you that there would be many barbecuers across the country who would argue with the statement that you will never find better tasting barbecue than uh, using this oven. I, I'm not actually a particular fan of barbecue myself, but I definitely know um, people would definitely argue that point. Art of baking. Interesting. Checkerboard cake. White layer cake. So this is a full-on cookbook here. It's not particularly focused on outdoor cooking. Um, it does seem to be trying to advertise the RCA Estate, uh, which is an oven and range combo appliance. This is 1952. 
Let's see, what's next? The Hungry Man's Outdoor Grill Cookbook. Finally. I mean, not finally, I think this isn't the first one that we've come across, but, but this book is specifically about outdoor grill cooking. Priced at $1.50. You can see in the lower corner here. Um, and this is from 1953. By the staff, Home Economists, Culinary Arts Institute. Copyright 1953 by Spencer Press Incorporated. Let's see. Contents. Charbroiled steak, grilled chicken, ground meat and barbecue sauce, grilled hamburger, cheeseburgers. That's the first mention that we've seen of those, but I haven't looked at every single page of everything. Beef roast on a spit, grilled fish steak, uh, bacon steaks, grilled Canadian style bacon, turkey on a spit, hot grilled franks, barbecued bologna roll, kebabs. Grilled lobster, rock lobster tails, <clears throat> frog's legs feast, sauce painted spare ribs, hot plate lamb chops, charcoal broiled ham slice, <clears throat> trout in bacon wrap, liver steaks, roasted leg of lamb, dinner in a boiler, chicken on a spit, hospitality section. <clears throat> so let's see. Oh. We have a salad recipe. Because outdoor grilling, what, what else do you expect? It's a salad recipe. All the ingredients for this salad can be prepared ahead of time and then chilled in the refrigerator. When eating time comes, all you have to do is get them from the refrigerator and toss them together. Wash in cold water and drain well, one head of lettuce. Tear into bite-sized pieces, wash gently but thoroughly in cold water and drain well, one bunch of watercress. Cut into short sprays, place greens in plastic bag and chill. Rub wooden salad bowl with cut side of one clove of garlic. Rub the bowl? with the garlic. Okay. Just before serving, I don't cook, by the way. Just before serving, toss greens lightly in bowl with half a third cup of French dressing. Cut into serving size pieces, two firm tomatoes, one ripe avocado peeled. Toss slightly with greens, scatter on top, two hard cooked eggs, cut into quarters, pitted colossal ripe olives. Mix four servings. And there's a recipe for French dressing. But we have, a, we have encountered a salad recipe. I think there were salad recipes in some of the earlier books too. But grilled hamburger. Wait, where's the cheeseburger? Where's the cheeseburger? I want the cheeseburger. Cheeseburger! Outdoor menu, iced fruit juice, cheeseburgers, relish buns, potato chips, vegetable kebabs, ice cream cones, beverage. Cheeseburgers, they'll be eaten as fast as you can grill them. Mix one egg beaten, one tablespoon Worcestershire sauce or prepared mustard, one teaspoon salt, one teaspoon monosodium glutamate, one teaspoon onion salt and or hickory smoked salt, quarter teaspoon of pepper. Interesting that they just call out the monosodium glutamate right there. Um, it is definitely a flavor enhancer, which is likely what it's being used for here. Um, it has a bad reputation, <laughs> but also this was 1953. So mix in with a light touch 
two pounds ground beef. Better under than over on the seasonings. That's enough for now. Shape the hamburgers to the size of your buns, four to six of them. Brush burgers with melted butter. Place in greased steak broiler. Grill three inches from coals about six minutes. Turn to brown side second and brush again with butter. Grill second side about six minutes. After four minutes, top brown side with cheddar cheese slice. As second side browns, the gold cheese will, quick, will melt over the burger. They will be done so quickly that you're likely to get a genius rating. Serve the burgers pronto in toasted buns. Next time, try adding chopped dill pickle, chives, toasted nuts, chopped mushrooms, or sesame seeds to the meat mixture. They're good with cheese. Huh. And in this cookbook, 1953, we have a recipe for something called surprise hamburgers. Mold the hamburger mixture around cubes of cheddar or Swiss cheese. Grill the same as useful. The soft cheese centers will be a pleasant surprise. For really fast cheese flavored burgers, sprinkle browned burgers with grated Parmesan cheese just before serving. If any of you are familiar with the upper Midwest, you will be familiar with these surprise hamburgers as a Minnesota uh, signature style burger known as the Juicy Lucy. Um, I don't remember when, when was the Juicy Lucy invented? Uh, sometime in the 1950s is the best information that I've got on when the Juicy Lucy was first introduced and this book giving a recipe for surprise hamburgers which are just the Juicy Lucy is from 1953. So this book and the introduction of the Juicy Lucy are roughly around the same time period. What else? Quick fish sauces, grilled fish steaks, griddle cakes. The f photographs in this book. This family uh, having watermelon at a picnic table by a lake. They look They don't look happy, <laughs> but uh, interesting. They're all wearing um, blazers. Grilled Canadian style bacon, skillet coffee cake, scrambled eggs, baked beans, hot grilled franks, banana boats. The proof of their goodness is in the eating. Place on flattest side. Green tipped or all yellow bananas, one for each guest. Pull back part of upper section of banana peel. Do not pull off. Cut a trench the full length of the banana. You can eat the cut out banana. Poke into trench along length of banana, one cup of marsh, sorry, one cut up marshmallow. Alongside of marshmallow, place small milk chocolate pieces. Pull banana peel back into place over filling. Place banana on grill, flat side down. Roast until skin is black. Pull skin back as you eat banana. Interesting, Hannah. I, I had never considered that somebody might have an allergy to bananas. Um, but yeah, that, that's interesting. So they want you to take the banana, peel back the peel, but don't remove it. Uh, cut out a trench that you then put pieces of cut up marshmallow into and uh, chocolate chips alongside that. Then put the peel back over 
and then grill it until the peel is charred black. And after grilling it, you would peel that back again and you would have gooey marshmallow chocolate all over the banana, the soft banana. Um, it sounds good. You have what's called a banana intolerance. Can't eat raw bananas as they upset your stomach, but put them into things like banana bread and you're okay. So banana boat might actually work because that's gonna be a cooked banana. So if it's raw bananas that are the problem, a cooked banana like this might be okay, but also you know your sensitivity better than I ever could, so I can't say for sure. What else? We've got 15 minutes left in the stream today. I'm going to pull out the next book, um, which is another James Beard. <clears throat> we have James Beard's complete book of barbecue and rotisserie cooking. If you remember earlier today, we looked at a James Beard book um, it was this one, Cook It Outdoors, the extremely sexist one. Uh, so we're going to take a look now at this one that is, so the Cook It Outdoors was from 1941. <sighs> getting them out of order which I mean they're not in shelving order anyway they're in chronological order so they're all out of order anyway but um, for now uh, so we went from 1941 this is now a James Beard book from 1954 barbecue and rotisserie cooking Today, nearly everybody is discovering the joys and the pleasures of barbecue and rotisserie cooking. And in this book, the famous food expert Jim Beard, author of The Fireside Cookbook, gives you a simple, clear, direct guide to some of the best meals of your life. He tells you all you need to know to become an expert, from the building of the barbecue or selecting of your rotisserie through the preparation of really exciting food. This book covers cooking both outdoors and indoors. The newest thing in cooking is smoke cookery. It's one of the oldest and most practical forms of cooking and Jim Beard tells you how to do it. How to make the smoke, uh, sorry, how to make the smoke cooking stove or where to find one. These old fashioned methods of cooking by direct heat inherited from our pioneer ancestors are wonderfully enhanced and extended by famous recipes from foreign lands. Mexico, Latin America, France, Italy, Spain, Russia, China, Japan, and the Scandinavian countries. Here is information on the grilling and broiling of beef, lamb, pork and ham, veal, frankfurters, poultry, including chicken, turkey, ducklings, and goslings, game covering pheasant, partridge, quail, squab, venison, and bear, and seafood of all kinds, rotisserie and spit roasting of beef from a small fillet, uh, uh, sorry, from a small fillet up to half a steer is explained, with the rules for buying good beef and suggestions for seasonings and such trimmings as Yorkshire pudding. The best ways to handle various cuts of lamb on a spit are explained, as well as suggestions on cooking pork, from roast suckling pig to spare ribs, and the author points out flatly, fowl and game roasted on a spit are to me far superior in flavor to the oven cooked product, and tells you how to go about it. Uh, so, the complete book of barbecue and rotisserie cooking with drawings by H. Rosenbaum gets us <clears throat> so we're 1954 mid 50s now you can see the illustrations of equipment have changed slightly from what we used to have in the um, 1920s I'm going to take a quick sip of water I've been reading a lot.
still really familiar forms um, to what we saw for the camp cookery, like the camp cooking utensils. Um, but just kind of like modernized into that 1950s aesthetic. Um, fuel and fire building. So still starting in the same place as all of those old books. Uh, some information on electric units. <clears throat> An old form of cookery on a revolving spit next to direct heat has been revived lately in modern dress with the invention of the compact electric rotisserie, which may be used in the kitchen, the porch or patio, anywhere within reach of an electric outlet. They are handsome to look at and with a roast or turkey or duck inside, turning under the infrared rays and oozing delicious juices, they offer an appetizing sight to hungry people. <clears throat> so looking at new methods for doing old styles of cooking. We have grilling and broiling. Let's see. We have a cow and a chicken and a pig and a pheasant and a sheep and a lobster and some fish. Beef. So some very basic information being given here with um, the different types of cuts, porterhouse, sirloin, <clears throat> rib steaks, minute steaks, shell steaks. Shell steaks, what are shell steaks? These are cut from the contrafilet, the half of the porterhouse that is left when the filet has been removed. They are the best choice if you want to serve individual steaks. Yes, nineteen mid fifties explains the artwork. It that is this is very definitely mid fifties illustrate illustrative style. Interesting. I had not heard of shell steaks before today. Um, that is a cut I was unfamiliar with. Pan broiling steak sandwiches, marinated steak, barbecued steak, steak rosemary, pepper steak, cheesed steak, minute steak. Flank steak, deviled beef bones, hamburgers. Because we're interested in backyard grilling, I'm, I'm doing a lot of hamburger stuff. I should look at hot dogs. I should see if there's hot dogs in here. We don't have that much time left. I'm going to look for hot dogs. Pork and ham, pork steak, marinated pork steak, tenderloin chops, barbecued pork chops, ham steak, Grilled pig's feet, veal, veal chops, frankfurters. I think that's as close as we're gonna get, gonna get to hot dogs. Most Americans think they know all there is to know about cooking frankfurters. They simply grill them in a pan or folding grill, or heaven forbid, boil them. Slap them on a tasteless frankfurter roll, pass the mustard and piccolini, uh, and that's it. Actually, the lowly hot dog is a very versatile animal if properly treated and can be distinctive eating. First of all, if you're going to serve them sandwich fashion, don't feel bound to use the standard frankfurter roll. Try instead some tender little finger rolls from your local bakery, or better yet, some small French rolls. You'll find e either of these finer in texture and better flavored. Try some of the following suggestions for sprucing up the hot dog. Cut a deep slit in one side of each frankfurter, insert some sharp cheddar cheese, and wrap the frankfurter with a strip of bacon to hold it together. Fasten with a toothpick and grill. Grill whole frankfurters and serve them with a good homemade chili. Pan grill thick slices of beefsteak tomatoes. Grill frankfurters and serve each one on top of a s tomato slice. Heat frankfurters or knockwurst over hot coals. Cut them into bite-sized pieces, insert a toothpick in each one, and serve with a large bowl of hot barbecue sauce for guests to dunk their portions into. This is good as a hot snack with drinks. 
Mix up your favorite biscuit or bread dough, roll it out about half an inch thick, cut it in strips as wide as the length of the frankfurters and long enough to go around once and lap over. Roll each frank in place or in a piece of, of the dough, arrange these on a greased baking sheet and bake in a moderate oven until the dough is cooked through. Grill frankfurters, place on toasted rolls, top with pickle relish and a slice of cheese. Reheat to melt the cheese. Texas Hots. Serve grilled franks on toasted rolls and heap ground meat and chili and chopped raw onion in the sandwich. Put grilled franks in a hot, toast, hot toasted buttered rolls. Add some good barbecue sauce and heat. Top frankfurter sandwiches with the following sauce. Saute chopped onion in butter until just soft. Add tomato sauce. Season to taste with salt and pepper. Bring to a bubbling boil. Add sour cream to taste. Cook until just hot, but not boiling. French fashion. Spread a French roll with garlic butter to which you have added some chopped chives and parsley. Add a grilled frankfurter to each to uh, or add a grilled frankfurter and a slice of cheese. Wrap the whole thing in a piece of foil and heat until the cheese melts. Have a bowl of hot barbecue sauce for everyone to dunk his serving in. Somehow I doubt that people in France would be familiar with the French style of serving a hot dog. <clears throat> Long frankfurter roll. Split a loaf of French bread the long way. Butter it with garlic butter and toast lightly. On the bottom half, arrange sliced tomatoes, sliced onions, sliced cucumbers, frankfurters or knockwurst, which have been split and grilled, and mayonnaise, and cheese if you like. Top with the other half of the loaf, cut through in thick slices the round way. Serve with radishes and green onions. So that does seem significantly different than how we would normally serve them. A lot of these seem fairly standard for serving a hot dog to me. Um, chicken burgers, pheasant and partridge, quail, whole sections on seafood again, rotisserie and spit roasting, mutton, rack of lamb, arro con pollo, chicken and corn. cooking with smoke. That was the new thing that he talked about at the, in the introduction, was that there was a whole thing in here on cooking with smoke. Picnics, clam bakes, and big party dishes. Again, those were things that were common in the camping cookbooks. Vegetables and salads. A whole section on salads now. Um, those were not in the original book books that we were looking at. Bread and dessert. So it's a full cookbook now. Oh, Hannah, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, I will um, definitely look at more Frankfurter stuff next week because I'm going to try and pay attention to things like hot dogs and hamburgers as we continue exploring. Um, but we are reaching the end of our time for today. Um, thank you to everybody who stopped by, everybody who's hung out um, as we've explored some of these uh, cookbooks from our Rare Books collection, um, trying to look at kind of the history of the American back backyard grilling uh, tradition. Um, we definitely have reached the mid-1950s today. We've got through the World War II period, um, got to the mid-50s. Next week, I think we'll probably make it into like the 1970s um, with the books. Uh, we ended with a James, Jim, James Beard book, um, and we will start with another James Beard book next week. Um, <clears throat> but then we've got Uh, I think we're going to start getting to some of the actual like grill manufacturer books next week. Um, so that'll be kind of interesting to see what they do. I think we've got a Weber grill book that'll be interesting to look at. Um, 
So I hope that you'll come back next week, Wednesday at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time on uh, twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios or twitch.tv slash Rogan27 to join me as I explore these items through uh, in our rare books collection here at Virginia Tech. Um, I am going to set up a raid and let me see where we're going to go. You know, I think we will head over to Librarian Liz because, oh, no, wait, Liz just raided me. So, um, <laughs> Well, welcome in everybody from Librarian Liz. I was actually ending my stream and I was about to head over to you. Um, but welcome in. Thank you all for joining. Um, we were looking at um, rare cookbooks or books from our rare books collection, exploring the history of American backyard grilling. Um, we will be continuing that next week. So if you want to uh, drop by around 2.30 p.m. on Wednesday, next Wednesday, um, We'll be continuing our exploration of cookbooks uh, relating to the, the topic of American backyard grilling. Um, but we are at the end of stream, and I hate uh, ending right after getting a raid. Um, thank you so, so much for coming. But um, we will, since I can't raid Liz, uh, we will head on over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, they are doing stuff for Shark Week, and it looks like they've got the hammerheads today. Uh, so that is where we will head. Um, I'm gonna set up that raid on both channels. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you, Liz, for the raid. Um, and thank you, everybody, for coming by. Um, Definitely hope that you'll stop by again another time. Uh, I'm just get get the raids set up and going. Um, and yeah, uh, you can also check out other things on the VTUL Studios channel. Um, that's twitch.tv slash VTUL Studios. If you want to check out other things that Virginia Tech University libraries are doing, um, we have some audio mixing uh, streams that go on. We also do some uh, tabletop role-playing game one-shots during the academic year, so those will be starting up again soon. Um, so if you're interested in anything like that, feel free to give a check uh, to check out the the uh, main channel that I stream on for work stuff. Um, but it's always welcome to have people joining me on my personal channel as well, which is why I co-stream this, this particular show. But uh, I'm going to call it for now and switch over to the ending screen. Um, again, thank you everybody for coming, and I will see you again next time. <laughs>